Last time, Doug and Tony were thrown into a mine cave-in and got separated. Now over 200 men are trapped and Tony doesn't know where Doug is. Tony! Doug, I'm here! Are you all right? Yes! They can hear each other, but Tony is behind the cave-in and can't find a way out. Doug says, I can get to the surface. I'll get help. Where's the rescue crew? There isn't any. What are you? All those men down there, they'll die. What's the difference? They're no better than the rest of us. Now you pick up that phone and you get some men together. Oh, come now. What are you talking about? What else is there to talk about, mister? That, that thing out there. Do they have a coal monster? What's he talking about? <laughs> Number one, it's 1910, and that's Halley's Comet, or Halley's Comet, however you want to say it. We're not sure which one is correct. We knew the Earth was going to pass through its tail, and some bogus astronomers predicted that certain gases in the tail were going to ignite and incinerate everything on Earth. Other astronomers were quick to point out that there was no way that could happen, but predicting the end of the world makes a much better news story. Hence, you got stuff like this. In reality, the most interesting thing that happened during the comet's appearance that year was Mark Twain died. Spoiler number two, Halley's Comet has never looked like that in all the history of people seeing it. In 1910, it looked like this. A spectacular sight to be sure, but not a big red fireball that rivals the sun. In the control room, they keep getting images of large groups of people looking at something, but they can't tell what. We have a time fix, but we just haven't located them in space. That's why it keeps shifting. A comet. Early 20th century. Well, I doubt they're on that thing. Of course, Halley's Comet. Jerry. Jerry, get research to give us everything they've got on Halley's Comet. Right away, General. I repeat, that doesn't look like any comet ever seen by humans. And sightings of Halley's Comet go back 2,000 years. Are you sure you want everything? Ray is the one who paid attention in school, so he remembers the last sighting was 1910, which tracks with the period clothing they're seeing. Let's see if Ann can get a spatial lock now. It's Doug. You've got the fix, Ann. Now clarify the image. Somebody's got to help those men or they'll all die. Nobody can save them. We can't save ourselves. Then I'll do it alone. Did the control room see that conversation? They reacted like they did, but why was it full screen and not on the tunnel's viewer? It's hard to tell. Doug is digging at the cave-in, determined at least to get Tony out, but preferably everybody. Tony would like to help from the other side, but Doug has a pickaxe and he doesn't, so never mind. They punch a hole through. Are you all right? Where are the rest of them? Trapped in the next shaft. Can we dig them out? I don't know, the main cave and happened at the far end. We better get out of here. This one's about to go to. Well, what about those men? We can't just leave them here to die. We need help. All the men we can get. Well, where are they? Why aren't they here? Not now, Tony. I'll explain later when we don't have a hundred tons of rock falling on our tender little heads. Except I'm not sure Doug understands it yet either. May 1910. That's Halley's Comet. That's right. Is that what you mean by the end of the world? They start trying to explain that the comet is going to pass by harmlessly, but the old boy won't believe it. Besides, he says, those men are probably dead already. That's a direct line to the shaft. Yeah. This is plain. We're trapped on the third level. We can't get through. Or not. Tony says, how do I tell them they've been abandoned? 
He says, we're putting a crew together, just hang on. Moments later, more cave-in activity severs the phone line. But Blaine and the others have hope. Help is on the way. Doug and Tony just have to find some. The problem is, an astronomer at a local university has predicted that the comet is going to hit the Earth, and that's why everybody is so apathetic. I haven't been able to find any actual predictions of that kind for the 1910 appearance, but you get the feeling it's just this one guy, and his pronouncement hasn't made it far beyond his own city limits. But it's gone far enough to kill 200 men for no good reason. Words have consequences. Doug is going to find the professor and get him to retract his statement, while Tony will go into town and try to gather men for a rescue party. He goes to the sheriff, but he's by himself and taking calls from other towns asking for help. Most of the region is rioting, on fire, and worse. He's already sent all the men he had to a bunch of other places. But what about the townspeople? Where are they? They haven't just vanished off the face of the earth. Try Pilgrimage Hill at the south end of town. That's where they all run off to. Took off? Why? Seems like they all took up with religion all of a sudden. They're praying and waiting, and that's about all a man can do right now. The people are ignoring Tony. They're standing there with torches in self-absorbed silence, staring at the not really a comma and waiting to die. I don't know what religion they suddenly got, but it seems really stupid. Doug is writing feverishly on a chalkboard, trying to prove to the professor that the comet won't hit Earth. In the control room, they say if he had a radar scope, he could prove it in seconds. And says, we have one, let's send it to him. Uh, if it comes tumbling into the scene the way he and Tony do, he may have to put it back together before he can use it. Now give us a fix on the comet, Jerry. I want to get more readings. I don't think we should focus too long on this comet. Why? Well, I was just thinking. If our focus puts us within its magnetic field, what possible effect could that have on the... Masses of opposite polarity attract each other, sir. The magnetic forces would blow out every power unit in this complex. The general says, would we learn anything from that? And says, probably. We tend to learn more from failure than we do from success. Ray says, stay focused on the comet. I'm not sure I follow the logic here. If they blow out all the power, they lose Doug and Tony. Or am I missing something? Anderson? Oh, I just came over to see what I could do to help. How'd you make out on the hill? There's nobody with me. Henderson's gone, too. The sheriff grabs a couple of tools and says, let's go dig these guys out. Henderson! You know, you know, young fella, you got me to thinking. Evening, Sheriff. A man has no call to sit around and wait for the end. When it comes, he ought to be doing something. Oh, here I am. There's your crew, Tony. But Henderson isn't taking the rescue aspect seriously and causes yet another cave-in. At the observatory, Doug isn't having any better luck. His calculations confirm the professor's prediction. I'm reasonably sure he didn't see that coming. He needs that radar scope, and he needs it right now. Now. <laughs> I don't think it's supposed to do that. Tony's legs are pinned from that last cave-in. Henderson is dead. The sheriff escaped the worst of it, and he's trying to dig Tony out. Doctor, there's something odd going on. How do you mean? Remember what you said this afternoon about the magnetic attraction of masses? Yes, what about it? Well, wouldn't the comet and Earth assert attractive forces on each other? Of course, Jerry, but practically speaking, Haley's comet today is several billion miles away from... Jerry, you're not keeping a constant fix on the comet. Yeah, but that's what I mean. I can't. There's something weird about this thing, about the way it affects the controls. I'd suggest veering away from the comet and focusing on something less big, like trying to send Doug a radar scope again. Without one, he's trying to figure out what's available in 1910 that he could use to prove there's some dark mass out there that will make the comet veer off at the last moment. See what you did to me? Is it too early for the radiometer? The Nichols radiometer. There aren't a half a dozen of them in existence. Do you have one? As a matter of fact, we do a special gift to the university, but I still oh, feel... Get to see what this... Please, I'll prove my thesis to you. Hurry! 
They hook it up to the telescope, and sure enough, it picks up a non-reflective mass out there that's plenty big enough to change the path of the comet. You're right. It's going to miss the Earth. We've got to get this news out. He goes to his phone, which we've already established is dead. Doug says, you have to go up to the hill. I'll explain on the way. Once he's told the people he was wrong and convinced them, it's time to go save some miners. Those miners may have a better chance than the people in the time tunnel complex. They've discovered that the tunnel is connecting them with the 1910 comet and its gravitational forces are acting on the machinery. Jerry warned them not to stay focused on it for too long. Jerry's right. The time tunnel does connect us with the comet. We're in the same time segment. Don't you see the quotient of the value of the Segment, time? quotient, you can prove anything with words, equations. I'm talking about a common sense definition of time. I'd also like a ham sandwich. Hold the mayo. What does a common sense definition of time have to do with anything that's happening right now? Common sense definition? Jerry got the power. Cut her off. Power off. All system. Jerry got the power. I said cut it. I have cut it off. What's wrong? Power's jumping the circuit breaker. But that's not possible. I know, but it's happening. The general orders an immediate evacuation. But before everyone can get out, the gravitational pull from the comet grabs Jerry. It's going to suck him into the tunnel and into the 1910 comet where he'll be incinerated. Because Irwin Allen comets are giant fireballs, not the dirty snowballs we already knew comets really were. All those can do is give you a big clunk on the head. An Irwin Allen comet can reduce you to ashes. So there. <laughs> Shutting down all the circuit breakers didn't stop it, but that did. Good enough. Jerry is safe, that's what counts. And they didn't blow the whole place up. That's also a plus. What's the matter? You stop breathing. It was hard to stop. It's a massive electrical shock. Get the emergency resuscitator on the double. Ann rigs up a makeshift defibrillator and gets his heart started again, and the medics take him away. We almost brought the comet itself back. I'd say that it's time to re-examine the whole project. Now, uh, just what is that supposed to mean? Just this. We're dealing with forces of cosmic proportions about which we know little or nothing. The dangers, you mean. Ray, all experimentation has a certain amount of danger. A certain amount, Ann. Bringing the force of Halley's Comet across a few billion miles and right into the tunnel, a certain amount. Aren't we forgetting something? Jerry warned you not to focus on the comet so much. You ignored him. Ray was the one who caused this and almost got Jerry killed. Now he's losing his nerve. I'd say he owes something to the project for that screw-up. But nobody's going to mention any of that. Instead, they're talking about Doug and Tony. I'm only trying to measure their lives against others we're endangering. Our own. Oh, that isn't fair. Now, Ray has risked his life as often or more often than any of us in this project. I, I know, I'm sorry. The thing to do is not to scrap the project, but to try and build more safeguards around it. General, don't we say that a couple times a year? Then we come right back here the next morning and start playing with forces beyond imagination. Yes, you and Ann both said it. You learn more from failure than you do from success. You don't know what safeguards you need to build in until you encounter something like this. Then you analyze it and deal with it. That's called, oh, there's a word for it. What was it? Oh, yeah, science. In the tunnel, Blaine has managed to fix the phone wires. How long before you reach us? We did it. They're coming down from the hills. A whole mob of them. Enough to dig out those tunnels in no time flat. How long is that? I guess we won't find out. Where to now? They've been separated in time. Tony appears to be in the middle of nowhere. He 
He's at the time tunnel complex. He's back home. I'm one of the men in charge of the station. You must be new here. I'm Dr. Newman. I'm back. I've been here 14 months, mister. I never heard of any Dr. Newman. 14 months? But I've been here every day for the past seven years. Now what's the problem, soldier? Jigs? He says, I almost didn't recognize you without the mustache. Jig says, I don't know what you're saying, mister, but I don't know you and I've never had a mustache. In the control room, they can see what's wrong. According to the license plate on that Jeep, it's 1958. You brought him back 10 years ago. We didn't. It just happened. Travel here, Sergeant. Doug! Doug, they got you back, too. We better get going, Doc. We got a weird one here. It's Phillips. Yep. Ten years ago, Newman was still in school then. He and Phillips hadn't even met. Tony still doesn't know why none of these people recognize him. In the control room, they don't have any choice. They'll try to send him wherever Doug is, so at least the two of them will be together for the next location probe. Doug drives off. Tony breaks free and tries to run after him. Those soldiers get ready to shoot him. <laughs> Then they go back to their quarters and pretend they didn't see that. As for our heroes, I hope they like Japanese food. Everything must be destroyed. Everything. We must leave nothing for tomorrow morning. I will see to it, Sir Tom. Everything in every office. Hi. With a little careful talking, they managed to sort out where they are. I assure you, we. We didn't know this was the Japanese consulate. Everybody in Honolulu knows that. The day before the attack on Pearl Harbor. And they're in the Japanese consulate in Honolulu. They excuse themselves, but the ambassador there sends one of his men after them. He says, if they make a suspicious move, kill them. The first thing I notice is this. <laughs> That is a modern day flag. At the start of World War II, the most common flag of Japan looked like this. It had the rays of the rising sun. But that's the worst gaffe I can find and it's all of two seconds long, so I guess they did all right. Again, I couldn't find anything in actual history where somebody thought the comet was going to impact the Earth. We knew we were going to pass through its tail and all the panic came from that. Turns out when you pass through a comet's tail, you get a really cool meteor shower. That's it. But they had to come up with something that they could deal with right here in the good old USA because the astronomer who decided the comet's tail was going to wipe out all life on the planet was in France. Doug didn't have time to take a plane across the Atlantic, especially since the first nonstop transatlantic flight wouldn't happen until 1919. Those guys in the mine couldn't hold out that long. It did, however, take Jigs that long to grow his mustache once Tony gave him the idea. 